welcome all of well I, I welcome all of you to uh, pediatric grand rounds i'm very excited to introduce the speaker today uh, dr samuel volchmoma is a um, associate professor in the department of pediatrics uh, he is an he is an illinois native who uh, got his undergraduate degree at the university of illinois and then did his um, md phd at, at at the mayo medical school in rochester Minnesota. he then um moved to um, to Boston, uh, to Cincinnati, where he did his residency at, at a, a you know, top five uh, children's hospital at, uh, in Cincinnati. And then he moved to, uh, to, um, uh, to Boston, to uh, uh, Boston Children's and the Dana-Farber in, um, in 2001. I was fortunate uh, when I became the chief of hematology oncology in 2007, very quickly afterwards to meet Sam and he was my second recruit into the section of uh, hematology oncology, and I have never regretted uh, that recruitment. Sam has done a truly remarkable job over his 10, his, his 15 year tenure at the university um, in developing uh, programs of excellence in informatics. Uh, his CV is exemplary, and uh, he is currently has several major roles including being the Dean for Masters of Education for the Biological Sciences Division, the Director of Pedi the Pediatric Cancer Data Commons, the Associate Chief of Research Informatics Officer, sir, the Director of the Informatic Corps for the Institute of Translational Medicine, and he also has found time to be the Chief Scientific Officer and Co-Founder of Lithmus Health. Sam's um, um, commitment to the institution in building informatics uh, infrastructure, uh, collaborating with uh, uh, colleagues, has not just remained at the university, but also uh, has become international in, in, in scope. Um, he is a central figure within the children's oncology community in developing data commons. Uh, and he'll, I'm sure he'll talk about this more during his talk today. But not only that, he has also start, not just started, but initiated multiple additional data commons to allow both himself as a scholar and other scholars to really use the rich um, data sets that are being generated from children and other, both childhood diseases and adult diseases to really change how we think about medicine. So uh, I, with no further ado, I'd love to ask uh, Sam to uh, talk about his uh, talk about his work, uh, Sam. Terrific. Uh, thanks, John. That was a wonderful introduction. I really appreciate that. And of course, it's been a wonderful, uh, um, I guess, 13 years here so far, and I'm excited to, to uh, keep building our programs together. So I'm going to talk today a bit about, um, uh, about our uh, data commons in general, but I'm going to be talking about our, our, uh, our new project to build a socium data commons and what that means. Of course, here's an agenda, which you have to have a slide for an agenda at every talk, but I'd rather frame it in terms of what you're going to learn today. And uh, today, I hope that you come away understanding exactly what a data commons is and what makes it unique and different from just, say, a database or a registry. Uh, I want you to understand what the term real world data means and uh, how it relates to what we're, what we're calling the socium going to bring you up to speed on our efforts to build a international pediatric cancer data commons and then I'm going to pull it all together hopefully and 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 we'll talk about how can you study disease in the context of the socium. Uh, the slides are available at the link at the bottom uh, that link will be on every single slide and so uh, if you want to download them for whatever reason feel free to and feel free to um, share them as you want. So one of the things I, I think we all appreciate as pediatricians is that environment matters, right? And if you look at these two living areas, um, one is uh, pretty squalid and one is pretty nice on the right. And if you look at these two areas, you could imagine that kids that grow up and are raised in these two different environments may have different responses to the same disease and may have different outcomes. Uh, when I see uh, Dr. Solway give a similar talk, he chooses to have a picture of a bathroom full of cockroaches. So I thought I would spare you that at lunchtime. Uh, but but it's, um, it's really important to understand that environment matters. And much of what we talk about today will be uh, thinking about how can we quantify that environment and how can we take that understanding and apply it to how we look at and study disease. 
uh, I'll show this slide a couple times today because it's uh, it's the index case that we're thinking about, and that is how does environment affect asthma? Uh, on the left is a house and a pretty street in the suburbs, and it looks like a very clean area. And on the right is a, a, a apartment building that sits over a, a busy expressway. And again, you could imagine that a child that grows up in each of these environments may have the same type of disease, but may have different outcomes based on the types of non-clinical factors that they're exposed to. So how can we measure those factors? How can we quantify them? And how can we relate those back to potential intervention for those kids to help change their disease course? So the socium is an interesting term in that it's, it, it, it considers all the normal social determinants of health that we think of. A uh, uh, person's uh, economic stability, where they live, their neighborhood, what kind of healthcare they have access to, their education. But the socium also takes into account some other uh, important subtleties. So for instance, um, you know, we, we know ways to quantify a person's exposure to street violence, but do we ever think about, do they live in a loving home? You know, are, are they nurtured in a loving home that gives them a lot of attention? Uh, we talk about pollution and, and we talk about particulate matter in the air, but what about quantifying how many days a person has beautiful weather or has sunny weather, they're able to go outside? Uh, we can quantify somebody's activity. You know, we could do that through a wearable, but can we tell the difference between whether they're doing heavy labor or whether they're exercising. And is that important? So when we think about the socium, we wanna think about all these factors together uh, and, and what they mean in terms of how we can predict someone's response to a disease. Now, it's important to also consider how our socium data, data provide a link to the idea of structural racism. And people who experience structural racism often um, are, have, have negative social circumstances. They're uh, where they live, pollution, food insecurity, their economic conditions, uh, and in general live in more toxic environments where they're exposed to all sorts of, uh, um, all sorts of uh, violence and psychological stresses. Uh, and some of the work I show you later today from other groups here at the university uh, uh, capitalize on measuring uh, these types of psychological stresses and how they can affect someone's uh, health outcomes. So reversing these adverse consequences of structural racism requires accounting for these factors um, and how do you um, mitigate these factors. So why study the socium then is to try to figure out how these socium factors interact with human biology and how they can relate to disease and, and, uh, and outcomes. Um, and illness of any origin can, um, can compound these adverse effects. So if we can understand the socium, how do we quantify these factors, we hopefully can help mitigate these, uh, these effects. Real world data is a pretty common term of art now. And I, and I hear it all the time. And I hear people talk about real world data and real world evidence and use them interchangeably. And uh, you, know, you could learn a little bit about um, uh, about the vocabulary today, which I think will help you. Uh, so real world data is really a term used by pharmaceutical companies that are conducting clinical trials. And for a pharma company, real world data are any data that they don't collect as part of the trial. So that could be EHR data, it could be uh, imaging data, and it's everything else that a patient could generate. So it could be their own patient reported outcomes, could be from a wearable, could be from uh, surveys that are sent to the patient. Uh, another way to think about this is, as a clinical trial progresses, we're collecting all the clinical trial data, but once the drug is approved, pharma companies are very interested in this real world data, which is where all this socium data fits in. And then from the real, real world data, you can then derive evidence based on those data. So keep that in mind, because people toss these terms around a lot, and I wanna make sure you understand that real world data doesn't, doesn't just mean uh, a Fitbit on somebody or an environmental sensor. Real world data just means any of the data that aren't collected as part of routine clinical trial data gathering. So it could be electronic health record data or other data at the hospital. So some of the things you could think about answering some of the questions, if you had a good grasp on the socium data, for instance, uh, if you take two patients that are both getting cancer immunotherapy, one's from a heavily polluted area, one's from a, an area where there's less pollution, where the weather's nicer, do they, do they have uh, different responses to their immunotherapy? How can we measure that? How can we determine that? And if we determine that they do have different responses, how can we, how can we help mitigate that to improve the response for the person that is from the more polluted or from the area with, with worse weather conditions? Same thing with uh, blood pressure. You know, do do uh, do patients who live in high crime areas 
uh, have higher blood pressures than patients that don't. And more importantly, if somebody moves away from a high crime area, does that result in them having lower blood pressures? And what are the predictors for who's going to benefit the most? Uh, you know, if I moved away to an area with less crime, uh, would that have, would I have a different change in my blood pressure from somebody else who lives in an area with high crime who moves away? And how do you predict who's going to have the greatest effect? What are the, what are both the genetic and the, and the environmental things about that person that can help you predict that they'll have a greater effect? These are all parts of the uh, kinds, these are all parts of the data that we will collect as part of the sociome and that we can develop these predictive models for different patients. So of course there's, um, uh, and I'm sure you're all aware, there is a survival gap in Chicago as there is in, in many cities. And this Healthy Chicago 2025 report discusses this uh, survival gap and potential ways that we can study it and mitigate it. Um, over, the, over the years studied here, this, this five year uh, term, uh, uh, all groups had, um, had, had falling life expectancies except for, uh, except for whites. And you can see that there's a, almost a nine year life expectancy gap here between blacks and whites. And, uh, and to account for that on the right and the red, you see the major uh, drivers of that gap. And if chronic disease is, it look, chronic disease is the most important predictor, most important driver of that gap. So clearly there is an important um, component here that we can learn from studying the socium to help close this gap. And this report, which is actually quite interesting, discusses some ways to help mitigate that. Uh, uh, this is a, a much older diagram from a similar study that was done in San Francisco. And uh, this is a really interesting look at the entire spectrum of, of, um, of, of what affects a patient and their outcomes. And, and for us as clinicians, we always focus on what's on the right. Um, you know, their risky behaviors, uh, what, are their, uh, what are the status of their chronic diseases or injury prevention. Uh, we've, we spend a great deal of effort learning and focusing on the factors on the right. But if you push upstream, uh, we're talking about a lot of these socium factors. We're talking about uh, exposure to toxins, uh, somebody's um, uh, proximity to green space, what kind of healthcare they have or education. Uh, and if we can keep pushing upstream, we hopefully can have um, interventions which can have amplified effects downstream for, for patients and for populations. So as we talk today, think about uh, in your own mind, transitioning your own thought processes from solely focusing on what's on the right side here to moving upstream to what's on the left. I wanna spend a few minutes discussing uh, what a data commons is, uh, because I think it's really important to the concept of how we collect data and how we use it for research. Uh, tradi traditionally, we think about data in a database, and the most common way that most of us think about data is, is in an Excel sheet, like you see on the right here, where every row represents a particular patient and every column represents a particular um, aspect of that patient's health. So you might have uh, one column that's hemoglobin and one column that is the, is the patient's sex. Uh, and, so, and so this kind of database uh, it's very useful for doing research, and it's often stored in, a, in a, a set of tables, as you see on the left here, that are all linked together on certain keys that's behind the scenes. Uh, but this kind of database is limited in many ways, right? You can't uh, easily update outcomes, you can't easily share pieces of it with other groups, uh, and you can't easily combine data sets because they might have different standards for how the data were put in there. So having a spreadsheet is quite limited, um, and it is still the way that we do a lot of our research, but we need to start thinking about, um, about a, a more broad way of collecting and sharing data, and that's the idea of a data commons. Uh, and, and a data commons is a cloud-based um, set of data that shares many qualities to what a database is, but also goes beyond that. So uh, in one way, you can think of a data commons as having multiple groups contribute data to the data commons ecosystem. And that could be clinical, genomic, proteomics, images. Uh, but the, the data commons also will allow you to analyze those data. It will allow you to connect data sets together. Uh, it would allow you to download data under certain conditions. And it will also uh, regulate the use of the data commons by certain individuals who are authenticated to use it, and it will authorize them to use it in different ways. Uh, the data commons um, <clears throat> ecosystem that I spend a lot of time thinking about is the National Cancer Institute's Emerging Cancer Research Data Commons ecosystem, which is shown on the right. 
And uh, the databases that we're talking about are, are still part of this ecosystem. But what's important is that these databases, like the proteomic database, our pediatric cancer commons, uh, the genomic data commons, which is here at University of Chicago, they can all interact with each other and they all need to be able to share data with each other. And in this cloud environment are all those tools I talked about, the ability to understand the data model, the ability to submit data, uh, and then outside the cloud are all of the, um, all of the tools that let people interact with the, with the cloud-based environment, who's authenticated to log in, who's authorized to use different pieces of it. And this is what a real data commons ecosystem looks like. And this is where we're headed. So we need to get out of this notion of building these pillars, these silos of data, and, and really get into a much more broad, uh, broader concept of a data commons ecosystem. I think, one of the ways to learn more about uh, what makes up a data commons ecosystem is to look at what we're doing with our pediatric cancer data commons. And, and we've developed, a, I think, a pretty reliable, repeatable paradigm for how we add data to our pediatric cancer data commons. Uh, uh, one of the things that we've taken a lot of pride in is that we're, our goal is really to connect researchers and to build a network of pediatric cancer, uh, pediatric oncologists all over the world to share data, to be able to have better access to data, and ultimately, of course, to find better cures. Uh, as you know, pediatric cancer is exceedingly rare. For even the most common cancers, we're only talking about um, you know hundreds of cases in the U.S. each year. So to get enough cases to study it really requires this spirit of international collaboration to bring together all these different types of data together in one place that they can share. But this is not easy, both socially and technically. Uh, and I'm not gonna spend much time talking about the socio-political aspects, but suffice it to say that uh, sharing data between our country and other countries is very difficult and we have to jump through a lot of hoops to do that. But the technical hoops are, the technical hurdles are also fairly significant. One of the biggest problem we have is that uh, is that people do not collect data according to accepted data standards. Uh, this is a uh, this is a, a diagram or this is a, a chart showing uh, how age is represented in one of the big uh, genomic databases. And this is what happens when you let people just define their own way of of um, of representing age. You have it spelled different ways. You have it capitalized, not capitalized. You have uh, all different ways of saying year. Uh, and can you imagine taking two data sets that have age represented in different ways and trying to match them up and figuring out now with 100 data sets, how do you align them? How do you combine the data? And if we can't get something as simple as age right, how are we possibly going to get something more complicated like uh, neuroblastoma stage correct when we try to compare data sets? So our group takes a uh, a data standards first approach to everything we do. We will not take any data until we spent a lot of time learning about the standards and helping people um, harmonize their data into that standard. Here's another example of, of, uh, of why data standards are important. So if you look on the left, you see how one group may represent a patient's sex. This is, and this is not far-fetched. Many groups just decide, well, we're gonna call uh, male, we're gonna represent that in our database as a one, and we're gonna use zero for female. Uh, but if you look on the top, other groups may take the opposite approach. It's arbitrary, right? So they may represent male and female with the opposite numbers. And then you have a group at the bottom that may represent, uh, represent sex with the first letter of, of the term. This is obviously an unsustainable way of doing things. And if you have these three hospitals trying to put their data together, how could you possibly harmonize it, uh, especially if you can't get something as simple as this correct, and then you try to move on to complicated things like uh, chemotherapy regimens and, and lab results. So the approach we've taken is to, is to map uh, terms to uh, accepted international codes. So the National Cancer Institute maintains a large database of codes uh, that are unambiguous. So if you uh, map mail to this NCI's code and you go to the, to the site, everybody in the world using that code will know it represents the same thing and the same with uh, female and unknown and so forth. And so we spend an enormous amount of our effort figuring out ways to map all of our elements to accepted international codes. And where codes do not exist in this international database, we're able to help the NCI update their code system to include the, the terms that we've developed with our international collaboration. So uh, I think this is a really important point. If you're ever devising a study where you're gonna collect data and you're just sort of typing things into a dropdown, stop yourself and say, wait a minute, 
maybe there's a standard already for what I'm doing here and I'll go look it up and then you can put it into your form, which will then save everyone a lot of time later on. The, the example of standards that I like the best is thinking about um, cash machines. So back in the 80s, when cash machines first uh, were big on the scene, uh, you had to go to your bank's cash machine. If you were a Chase banker and you went to a Bank of America cash machine, forget it. You weren't getting any cash out. And now, as you well know, you could go to any corner of the world and put your card in some random machine in a pub somewhere and it'll spit cash out. And the reason that uh, banks have done that is because they knew, listen, we need a standard. If we don't have an interoperability standard, we're not going to be able to give people cash at these machines all over the world. And they very early on got down and made a standard and now everybody uses that standard. We're in many ways back in the 80s with our medicine where we don't have even the most rudimentary standards for matching things up. Now, of course, there are a lot of standards in use. Um, uh, these four areas listed here, content terminology, transporting data and, and privacy and security, uh, all have their own standards. And there's emerging popular standards that are, that are really uh, um, taking over as the accepted standard. So I'm very hopeful that as we move forward, we're gonna see a greater acceptance of certain standards um, that will allow us to have much better interoperability. I'm not gonna read through this. Of course, you can look at it later on the slides. Many of you have, some of you have probably seen this cartoon uh, from XKCD. Uh, it says, well, right now there's 14 competing standards and these two folks get together and say, 14, that's ridiculous. We need one universal standard that covers all the use cases. And soon enough, there's 15 competing standards. And that happens all the time. Uh, there's, there's, and many times um, uh, people think they know better and they take a bunch of standards and then develop another one thinking that that's gonna be the standard. And it just doesn't seem to work that way. Uh, so the approach we've taken is to start with consensus and to get international consensus. And to do that for us, we start with the actual case report forms that are used to collect data for clinical trials. So those can be handwritten forms, they can be computer forms, and we get, uh, for any disease that we're working on, this is an example here for brain tumors, we pull together as many case report forms as you can from all over the world, and then we start to harmonize those together. And of course, it's a mess when you start because for any particular item, you're gonna find it different across these case report forms. So you start to align them. This is a meticulous process that takes months and months to do. But then uh, over a period of time and over a period of many meetings, uh, and now we, we used to get to travel to these exotic places. Now we have meetings on Zoom. Uh, this is uh, where we built our AML dictionary you work with the international group and you actually painfully go line by line till you get an international consensus. This has enormous advantages in that when you're done, you have a consensus uh, dictionary that everybody accepts as the consensus and that going forward, people can use that dictionary to collect their new data so that you don't have to keep transforming it into the standard. You're gonna collect it in the new standard. So uh, a standard data dictionary um, uh, looks like this. You have, uh, you have your fields like sex or race or ethnicity, and all those are mapped to these codes, just as I mentioned, to these NCI codes. And then importantly, the accepted values are the, are the things that we ballot with this international group. So if you look at the accepted values for sex here, you see male, female, unknown, not reported. And that until recently, that was our list of accepted values. But then we started working with the germ cell tumor group and they said, we need undifferentiated in our list. Well, of course, we went back and we added undifferentiated into the list. And so now our accepted values are these five values, all mapped to these codes in the NCI's thesaurus. Having this dictionary is extremely helpful now as we take old data and harmonize it into our commons and we go forward and collect new data. This is an example of one of our very first commons, our neuroblastoma commons um, from the International Neuroblastoma Risk Group. We have uh, almost 27,000 patients in the commons. Uh, we have the data commons publicly available. This is a, a, a newer, um, this is a newer version of the interface, but if you go to our website, you can log into the older version. Uh, uh, you can see that we have um, uh, uh, the number of studies, the number of subjects. And if you dig in, uh, you'll be able to do a very, uh, um, a, a very granular search over all the data. You'll be able to look at which patients, not only their demographics, but, but their stage and their grade, um, whether they're, what their survival status is, and even some looking, uh, you can even look at some of their molecular results, you know, their NMIC amplification or their ALK mutation status. Uh, and so you can very quickly filter the subjects 
uh, and find out uh, if you have enough patients uh, potentially to do a study that you wanted to do, and then you can request those patients' data. We don't make the data available to anyone. You can search over the data, but you, to get the data, you have to apply for it and download it. We also are building in these um, uh, uh, visual analytics uh, so that you could quickly do survival curves. You can do uh, stratification by certain variables. This is a, a survival of, um, of uh, patients based on their NMIC amplification status of uh, high-risk patients. Uh, and, and very quickly being able to generate these curves, we think is a great way for people to do um, hypothesis testing to help drive downstream research. One of the things we're most proud of now is that uh, our team's been able to connect up with external data commons. And you remember in that cloud picture, I showed multiple data commons there that interact with each other. And uh, one of the most important things is how we can take data in our commons and we can connect it to data that exists in other commons. So these kids with neuroblastoma that were treated by the Children's Oncology Group also have data in a data commons called the target database, which is, uh, which is um, whole genome sequencing and exome sequencing. And that exists as part of the genomic data commons. So we can take a common identifier and we can link to those data. So if you do a cohort search in our data commons and then select to link out to the GDC, it will take you to a page in the genomic data commons with that exact same set of patients already pulled up for you. Now this is incredibly important because now you have this very rich genomic data here and in the in our PCDC, you have this very rich clinical data, which doesn't exist here. And now you can connect them together and have a full set of, of clinical and genomic data to work with. Going forward, uh, what's gonna happen is you'll have these cloud-based environments where you can actually combine these data and do these analyses in a cloud-based environment. So you won't even have to download the data to your machine. Uh, so this is a very important step. And we're working now to try to connect our data to data that's in uh, the imaging commons or the proteomic commons. Uh, and as more data commons uh, pop up, we hope to be able to continue to connect our data across these various commons. We're working with groups all over the world. Uh, we, we know this is an important international effort. There are obvious places in the world that we still need to, to, to move to and to try to help uh, bring standardization together. Uh, but we're working over almost all tumor types with uh, almost all the cooperative groups in, uh, in these areas. And then finally, this is our leaderboard. This is uh, on our website, and it shows that uh, over these, um, over all these tumors that we're working on, which is almost all pediatric cancers, uh, we have uh, some version of a data dictionary that's either in development or already developed. We have multiple data contributors committed. Uh, we are building these uh, consortia where we have uh, groups come together and agree on the rules of the road for sharing data. And then uh, listed here are the numbers of cases in common. And of course, the ultimate goal um, on the way to curing patients is to publish papers. And so we have an uh, active um, push to get people to use the data, to analyze data, and to publish papers. And we keep track of all this on our website. And for anybody who's interested in learning more about this commons or even working with us, either on our work or to help extend it to other areas, should please just come contact us. We'd love to help you with research or with learning more about uh, the kinds of work that we do. Our structure is now a common of commons, right? We have all these disease commons that work together. And then over that, we are now building these other work groups. So we have, we want somebody to be able to come in the front door and be able to just do a search over all the data we have. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to say, I only want to search over retinoblastoma data. You should be able to come in and say, hey, show me all the patients in the commons that have an ALK mutation. And we should be able to help facilitate that work for researchers. So we have a lot of work now over all the data commons and the governance that goes along with that. And then uh, coming soon, we're going to be launching two very important committees. We're launching an international scientific advisory committee and an external advisory board, which will be made up of people not in the pediatric cancer business, but people from uh, other industries to help us understand how our work fits in the global landscape of uh, pediatric cancer. So that was my update on, uh, on the PCDC. Uh, we have a, our, our first uh, big PCDC paper coming out next week on the 18th. Uh, and so uh, hopefully when that comes out, people will be able to learn about the work that we've done and the methods that we use to build the commons, uh, uh, focusing a lot on, on not only the technical aspects, but the governance, the, the intensive work that has to go into uh, putting in contracts and putting in agreements to get all this work together. Okay, so let's move on. Now that you understand why the socioome is important, and now you understand what a data commons is, let's talk about what it would be to build a, a data commons for the socioome and, and what, what are the uh, elements that go into that. 
Uh, we have a pilot project that we were just funded for. Uh, this is from a, a, a group called the Center for Data and Computing here at the university. Uh, this is a group that uh, grew out of the computer science department here. And uh, we were funded to study uh, uh, in particular, how the sociome affects asthma. And I'll go into some details about that. We have a large group of committed researchers working on this. Uh, the left two columns are all the faculty. And, and you'll notice that many of the faculty are not from the BSD, certainly not from pediatrics. And we have uh, folks from the geospatial data science group. We have uh, someone from Argonne. We have folks from the computer science department. Uh, folks from uh, from a lot of, from we have somebody from the Illinois Department of Public Health, and on the right are all the um, uh, students and fellows that are working with us uh, um, uh, from around Pritzker and from uh, other areas of the of the university. Uh, so this is a big effort, and uh, everybody's contributing. Uh, and uh, and you know we don't want to just solve asthma. This is a pilot project, and I think everybody working on this realizes that the implications for a much larger uh, use of the sociome uh, is, uh, is obvious. So again, back to this picture, you know, we want to know uh, how can we figure out which elements of the sociome are important for kids with asthma? What are the data that are important? So we started, uh, we went down this deep rabbit hole of publicly available data sets, collecting information about uh, the, the source of the data, how fresh is the data, uh, is it freely available, um, uh, how can we use the data, and, and what is the licensing. So, so we've taken a real deep dive into understanding the types and kinds of data that are available. And so far, these are some of the types that we've come up with. And some of them are obvious, like traffic and crime and where the parks are, uh, you know, whether it's a food desert, where the grocery stores are. But as you can see, there's a lot of other data here that, um, that you might not have thought of in your first time through. Uh, where are the after-school programs? Where are the most foreclosures? Where are the WIC clinics? Uh, and these are all things that we think may be important. Uh, one of the um, difficulties about this kind of work is we don't know what we don't know. And so we have to collect a lot of data in hopes that the things that are important will be in the kinds of data that we bring in. And remember, the goal here isn't to only build an asthma data commons. The goal here is to build a socium commons that can be used for multiple types of studies. So we have this data hub that we're building uh, right now. It's just a spreadsheet, but it, we have uh, a role for every type of data we're collecting with lots of notes, uh, where the data are from, hyperlinks to the data. Uh, and as this grows, we hope to, um, to keep updating this with new sets of data. Uh, it's going to be important that um, that we have an automated way to look at all the data on the spreadsheet, to have the data updated and refreshed. Uh, we have to build in, of course, a very rigorous um, quality control process. Uh, you have to make sure that the data you're getting in is not, um, is, 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 uh, is, goes through a process where you make sure that it conforms to your standard, that there are no data that are out of bounds, uh, and that is that you're putting in your data commons what you think you're putting in there. Uh, and of course, we want to have the most updated information. We want to make sure that uh, we're not using pollution data from 2015 if we have pollution data from 2021 that are available. So this is an important aspect of this work is um, not just doing another one-off study where we just you know, take data and stick it in the commons. We want to make sure that we do a study where we are taking tons of data and making it available for multiple types of studies. So right now we have 22 data sets uh, from these main areas. I have the links on here if you want to go look later. Uh, we have, uh, it's a lot of data we're bringing in. Um, and so it's a lot of data cleaning. It's a lot of data assessment. Uh, um, and, and keeping track of all these types of data, of course, is a difficult task, which is why we have a large team, both from the BSD and from computer science. I want to say a word about geocoding, since this is so central to the work that we're doing. Uh, geocoding is, is, is simply taking your uh, someone's address and turning it into latitude and longitude. Well, that's easier said than done because addresses, as you can imagine, in any database, which is not standardized, uh, can come in many shapes and sizes. How many different ways can you say lane or place or drive or avenue? And so first the data, the addresses have to be standardized, which is a difficult task. Um, and believe me, the addresses in Epic are not standardized. And then once the addresses are standardized, you can go through a geocoder and the geocoder will turn that address into a latitude and longitude, which is actually pretty accurate, you know, down to 10 or 20 feet. Uh, here's an uh, uh, example of Google's geocoding platform. And uh, this is publicly available. You can go to Google's site and use their geocoding platform. 
uh, I went to the site, I put in my own address and it, you know, showed me right where my house was down to, you know, a few feet and gave me my latitude and, and, and longitude. So it's pretty remarkable um, the accuracy you can get through a geocoder. So should we be using Google's geocoding for all of our work? Well, there's a few problems with using a publicly available geocoding platform. You know, although this is free, there's a limit they place on the number of queries. So if we want to geocode, you know, 30,000 people, uh, there's going to be limits as to how we can do that and how often we can query their system. But most importantly, uh, you know, we don't have a business associates agreement with Google, so we can't send them patient data to put through the geocoder. We have to have something that that we can host here in our HIPAA compliant infrastructure so that we can do the geocoding without ever having the patient's address leave the university or leave the, the BSD. So we've chosen a geocoder called Paleus and there were some options, but this is, seems to be the, the winner right now. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's free, it's open source, meaning that the, the code is available. So you can even look at the code and how it works. You can even modify the code. Um, the patient data will never leave the institution because this is being installed on our own HIPAA compliant servers in the Center for Research Informatics. And so now we can actually use this for geocoding our own patients and, uh, and make sure that we're HIPAA compliant the entire time. So that's what geocoding is. It's a really important part of this. Um, and so a lot of the data that come with, uh, that come from say city of Chicago, as you can see here at the bottom, have a latitude and longitude associated with them. So now you can start to think about, oh, I have pollution data, I have traffic data, and I have patient information. Now I can start putting them together because I can take these geocodes and figure out what, what is the pollution around a patient's house? What is the noise there? What is the crime rate? How close do they live to a park and so forth? So a lot of the information is, uh, is mapped according to the latitude and longitude. And if that's not available, we can do some inference because they have these census tracks. Uh, they have, um, uh, sometimes they have neighborhoods. So we get a, a more blurry picture, but in any case, for most of the data, we can associate it with a certain geographic location. As I said before, the data have to be cleaned. One of the biggest problems we have is just missing values. Uh, the data can be sparse. You might have crime data where for an entire uh, area, you don't have any data for a certain amount of time and you have to be able to deal with that in your analysis. And one of the um, computer scientists in our group is an expert on this very idea of how do you account for missingness in a data set? Uh, outliers and incorrect data points. And I mentioned this already, this is all part of the quality control process. We're also making advantage of the American Community Survey, which is part of the US Census. It's uh, from three and a half million households. Uh, it's uh, 27,000 variables. Uh, it's uh, geocoded ranging from the block all the way up to the county. And for us, the kinds of data that would be useful here are things that have to do with things like uh, child population de density, where people are living below the poverty line, uh, you know, what kinds of heating sources people use, you know, does oil or gas, does that affect a child's asthma? Um, and in combination with other data that we have, like where your nearest hospital is, your nearest pharmacy, we can try to think about identifying hotspots for, uh, for childhood asthma. So this is just a picture of what the population density map looks like. Um, come, uh, when, you, when you plot out this uh, data from the census. Uh, here's a, a population that are living below the poverty line. Um, and you can see on the south side of Chicago, of course, it's much higher than on the north side. Uh, and here's a graph uh, of heating sources. And of course, this is very coarse, right? Um, you know, you're, this is, looks like it's maybe county level data, uh, uh, but you can see that, uh, you know, the vast majority of heating in, in Chicago is gas um, uh, and not electricity or LP gas, whereas those are more popular in other parts of the state. So these are very important aspects of, um, uh, of uh, a person's environment that are probably gonna be important when we're studying a disease like asthma. This is not part of the census data, but this is a real exciting project from a group here at the university uh, looking at um, tree crown density. So they've mapped uh, every tree and uh, you can actually look down to the individual block level what the density of trees is, because this is obviously also important uh, to a child's environment and may have an important uh, impact on their asthma outcome. There are, of course, these aggregated measures you've probably heard about, um, you know, so social vulnerability index, for instance, and I've linked to a few of them here. Uh, you know, these have pluses and minuses. You know, they, they're using data to create this uh, basically static um, aggregated measure uh, that you could use to help make predictions. Um, uh, uh, but I think it's much better to go back and have the raw data available when you build your model. Once you start rolling these up to these other um, 
uh, these other variables that may be good for including something in your electronic health record. Uh, but I think for the kinds of research and work we're talking about, using these rolled up values is, is going to have less utility. But it's an important aspect of the work that we're doing and of Socium data. So um, all these links are here and you're welcome to go study these, uh, these on your own. Okay, so how do we put all this together? Um, you know, how do we make sure that we're uh, taking the socium data and the patient data and putting it together in a way that's analyzable? Um, uh, I think hopefully in your mind, you can start to see the pieces. Uh, so we have, uh, we have our data sets. Uh, we have all like your pollution, crime, weather, noise, you name it. And all those data sets have to have some sort of geocoding latitude and longitude. And we have to figure out how we're going to roll that up. Uh, we can roll it up to the patient's house, to the patient's block, to census blocks. In any case, we have to be able to aggregate and, uh, and decide what is the granularity of, uh, of how we're going to look at each of these data sets. And then we need to take all the patient data and we need to run it through a geocoder. And I already said that we're going to use this open source geocoder that's installed on our own infrastructure. And then you can do an analysis and you can build uh, a model to help do the predictive analytics that you're looking for. So specifically to our, our project, we need to identify asthma patients. Not an easy task. I would defy any of you to come up with an instant way to do that. Do we use ICD-9 and 10 codes? Do we use all patients that have been prescribed albuterol? Do we uh, have some other measure for patients that, ha that have asthma or that don't have asthma for a control group? It's not easy. And we've had many meetings to discuss how to do that. Once you have the identified, uh, identified patients, we can pull them from our data warehouse. We can get all the data we want from those patients, uh, demographics and labs, but also things like their images and image reports and notes. Uh, we can run that through our geocoder and then we can now attach the latitude and longitude to those patient data. And on the other side, like I, like we've been talking about, we pull all of our socium data together, also associating it with the geocode. And then comes, uh, you know, the, the data science part, you know, how do we normalize the data and then how do we aggregate it? And then how do we build a multifactorial model to explain uh, differences we see in asthma outcomes that are based on socium factors. And that's the goal, of course, is to build a model to see why the patients have different outcomes so that we can then recommend some sort of intervention to help change the outcome. So uh, just to finish up with a few examples of the kinds of work that are being done uh, here at the university looking at, uh, looking at uh, socium data. Uh, this was a, a project done in uh, David Melter's group as part of his uh, CCP project. Uh, and this was a student that used economic modeling to try to understand, uh, do patients from high crime areas, uh, are they more likely to miss their clinic appointments? And I think anecdotally, I think we would all agree that probably if you're from a high crime area and you have an appointment at five o'clock in the afternoon when it's dark out in the winter, you may be less likely to come to your appointment. So, um, so this student built this, um, this economic model and indeed showed that there uh, is a link between crime and no-show behavior. And interestingly, that link is stronger for women than for men. Uh, if you look at this model, you can see the same kinds of socium data that we're talking about, uh, sunset time, crime rate, uh, and that's married up with information about the patient, their uh, appointment attendance, uh, how many times they missed and so forth. So again, this is a socium type project, uh, but like many of these projects was done as a one-off. The data were collected as a one-off just for this study. Uh, here's a, a study uh, that's um, by, by uh, Liz Tong and others here at the university and what she did, looked at was uh, a link between uh, areas of high crime and whether or not there's a link between obesity and high blood pressure with areas of high crime. And uh, it was a very interesting study uh, and, and because it went not only discussed that there was a link, but it tried to understand why there would be a link. So uh, again, they used what the kind of data we're collecting, uh, where there are violent crime and nonviolent crime rates, and then homicide rates, uh, and then associated this with patients, um, uh, uh, whether they were obese and whether or not they had high blood pressure. Uh, and indeed, uh, found a correlation. So it's an indensely populated uh, high poverty regions of Chicago. Recurrent exposure to high rates of violent crime was associated with obesity and elevated blood pressure. So uh, interesting, and, and what they posit is that it has to do more with uh, patients having to be hypervigilant and stressed all the time. Uh, and this led to some of these downstream effects. And if you think back to that picture I showed before with the whole spectrum of uh, upstream and downstream, you know, these are upstream factors that are affecting health. And so we need to think about modifying these upstream factors. 
They also uh, put forth this three axle three axis model of health inequity inequity, which is not necessarily relevant to this study, but I thought was super interesting. So I put it in here. Uh, there's three different uh, axes here. So if you look at the uh, the race and poverty together, that's your demographics. Uh, if you look at the axes of place and poverty, that's your environment. And then uh, if you look at race and place, that's your social environment. And where you fit in this three-dimensional world uh, is, is very important to, um, uh, to how you will uh, respond to certain disease states. And I think this is a cool way of thinking about it. And the reference for Liz's paper is right there. And then finally, this is work from Corey Tabbitt's group, which is along similar lines. So what Corey is looking at is uh, these uh, the rates of violent crime in a patient's blood pressure. So what he's doing is he's plotting violent crime all over Chicago and then making these like little buffer zones, which are areas around the patient, which um, uh, which sort of say how close they are to the violent crime. And so he has this cool uh, uh, graph model showing that in the back corner, so these are, that the back corner is when you have violent crime very close to you recently. And you can see this spike in high blood pressure for those patients. And interestingly, as, as time goes on, so as you come down that slope, it doesn't fall particularly fast. So even a hundred days out, you're still seeing an effect from that violent, uh, that violent crime that occurred very close to home. And then it falls off very quickly. So if, if it happened a kilometer away, a thousand meters away, you can see that the, there's actually no effect on blood pressure. This is sort of like a hyper local phenomenon of having violent crime in your neighborhood. Okay, so uh, conclusions from all this, I think uh, that I'd want you to come away with are that um, data commons are a great way to promote data sharing and collaboration. Uh, and they do that pro by providing harmonized interoperable research data that come with rules, that come with governance, that tell you how you can share the data. Data standards are, I know they're not the, uh, the coolest thing in the world, but they're key to building a successful commons. And so you'll always hear me talk about data standards. Uh, I told you what real world data were, uh, and how it relates to socium data, and this critical to understanding and modeling health and disease. Uh, and the socium data commons that we're in the midst of building is going to house a large amount of standardized, harmonized data that can be aligned to patient data. And, and for us, again, we don't want to build an asthma socium commons. We want to build a a socium common so that anybody who comes with these projects about blood pressure or or um, or depression or 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 obesity or anything any of these um, downstream effects can use the same data that's already prepared for them to build their model and they don't have to go through all the same uh, um, uh, the same gymnastics to come up with a data set that they can use um, and so you know this is my final picture uh, you know for our kid with asthma. Um, you know, maybe it could be something as simple as having the kid walk a different way to school, maybe having the kid go a longer way to school where they go, where they have uh, more green space and less walk through a, a crime area or, or a noisy or polluted area. Maybe that's a simple intervention that could have a big difference. And this kind of modeling could actually hopefully turn up those kind, uh, uh, can, can help uh, reveal those possible interventions. Uh, so uh, I have a big group now that's working on these data commons uh, initiatives. Uh, so uh, we don't have a cool group picture anymore. We have these Zoom pictures. Hopefully soon we'll have a group picture, but uh, we're still growing. And if anybody is interested, especially the residents on uh, trying to uh, 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 figure out a project we can work on together, we'd love to discuss it with you. Uh, and uh, the group here is a, a very diverse uh, set of talents from project management to data standards to um, uh, computer programming. Uh, and everybody's come together, of course, to, to, to build these data commons. Uh, our funding is almost all foundational. We've been really lucky. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society in St. Baldrick's have given us millions of dollars to work on this. Uh, but, uh, but the NCI now, the National Cancer Institute, is really stepping up and helping give us much more funding because they realize that the, this work is really foundational to building a national ecosystem uh, to, to, um, uh, to share data. Uh, and it's not just pediatric data, right? We're working now on um, adolescent and adult data uh, it's through some of our cancers, but we're also thinking about things like uh, like a diabetes commons or thinking about um, uh, uh, an epilepsy commons. There's all sorts of cool things that we can do with the same set of tools that are going to benefit lots of different groups. And the NIH, I think, is finally realizing the utility. The socium work uh, really derives from our work with the ITM, our Institute for Translational Medicine. Uh, and the, our ITM, if you don't know, uh, 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 Julian runs our ITM, and it's a group of uh, of, of institutions in Chicago listed here, Rush, uh, Advocate, um, uh, North Shore, IIT, and Loyola. Uh, and so we can work with these groups to, uh, to develop um, technology that, that works over all the institutions. Uh, 
Uh, and so we're grateful for the Sociome funding from the ITM and hopefully going forward, we'll be able to do this type of work with our next round of ITM funding. And I mentioned CDAC as being a source for this pilot project. And then the last slide, I just wanna put in a plug. We're having a uh, really important talk in a couple of weeks from um, uh, Greg Simon. Greg Simon is an incredible speaker and he talks about clinical trials and the future of clinical trials. Uh, and he's gonna give a talk on Zoom um, on the 27th. And I would encourage all of you to sign up. Uh, you can download the slides at the link here. You can go to that link to sign up for Greg's talk. And with that, I think I will stop and see if there's any questions or any discussion that we can have. So Sam, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for an awesome talk. Um, there was one, uh, and I encourage others to put uh, questions in the chat or to ask questions in a moment. Uh, there's one from Susie Burrs in the, in, the, in the chat, which says, these resources are ever evolving. How do we ensure that the databases remain current, the tools remain best practices, and the socium scope remains relevant and appropriate to the research being conducted at the university? Do you want to address that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, it's really important that, um, that we try to continue to work on this national scale, but that we also try to make sure that we're um, contributing to the academic environment at the university. So uh, the way I think about it is, if, um, if someone comes to me and says, listen, I wanna build a diabetes commons, uh, they often wanna build a commons with the data they have here. My job is to encourage them to think bigger than that and to say, well, we can build a diabetes commons, but let's do it with 10 hospitals. Let's do it with consortia all over the country. Let's build a common data model for sharing those data. So I feel a responsibility for making sure that, um, that our scope um, continues to be on the national and international level while being sure that we're hyper-local with the kinds of work that we do here. Um, okay, so this, thank you, Sam. Oh, it's open for questions. Just unmute, please, and I'll, I'll, I'll recognize you. I'm lo just looking through to make sure I don't miss anybody. Actually, also show yourself if that's okay. It will actually be helpful. Okay, uh, let me ask a question, Sam, while I know there's going to be other people who want to ask questions. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a resident, uh, a pediatric resident. How do I really get, how do I really get involved with you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a number of ways, and we, we've we've had a very good repeatable process with medical students coming through. Um, and so, what we would love to work with residents on are defining a potentially, um, you know, year-long project that would be um, an important aspect of Data Commons development. Uh, our goal would be that the re the resident would have something that would be. Um, uh, some sort of, you know, publishable unit. Uh, we want people to come away with the experience of, of, of uh, either being able to present at a meeting or putting some uh, a paper in. Uh, we have tons of work to do. And depending on your background, if you have no technical background, that's totally fine. We can help put you to work on some of the more clinical aspects. If you've done some programming and you know something about databases, we can put you to work on the, on the uh, technical side. So I would just approach us, approach me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll ask you about the, the time you have to allocate and what your interest is, and we can Help define a project going forward. Okay. Questions? Julian, you usually have a great question, so I'm going to I'm going to pick on you actually to start off with. All right. Well, thank you, and <clears throat> congratulations, Sam, on a clear and, and wonderful presentation. Um, <clears throat> the, you know, um, many, Sam did mention the uh, Institute for Translational Medicine that. Uh, Laney and I lead, uh, along with Josh um, uh, Jacobs from Rush and Dorian Miller and uh, uh, Eric Beyer is, is also a key leader along with Sam uh, of the ITM. Uh, we are very focused in our renewal application actually that is pending right now, it hasn't been uh, uh, evaluated yet, uh, on the uh, role of the sociome and accounting for sociome factors. Uh, because they uh, so importantly interact with biology to determine um, uh, health and, and uh, risk uh, of, uh, of uh, unhealth. And, um, and because uh, they are the manifestations uh, often of uh, structural racism. And so it allows us to begin to understand how structural racism actually uh, it, its adverse effects actually can be uh, reversed. 
Thank so you. that's not exactly a question. Yeah, that's right. No, no, I, I, but a, a, a very important point. Julia. I'm glad, and I'm glad Julian provided that context because the the ITM going forward, I think, is going to you know is obviously going to play a central role here. You know, our our group is going to be the technology side of it, but the ITM as a whole is tackling this as a as a full scale um, initiative here on the south side, and it's going to be incredibly important. So um, we've got a couple of minutes left. Maybe I can I can entice Laney to actually make a comment about um, you know the challenges going forward of of taking people's um, potentially private information and, and and putting them into databases. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not structuring that question very well, Laney, but I, I'm sure you can riff on that from from that point. Uh, you know, it, it's it's an in it's a really complicated issue from a regulatory as well as from an ethics perspective. Um, in 2019, the uh, federal regs were modified to allow for what's called, quote, broad consent, which allows people to sort of put their information into uh, registries and databases, understanding that they're consenting to the fact that the research may be used in ways that they might not have anticipated at the time that they consented. What those regulations didn't address is what is really important for this data commons is what happens to privacy when you start linking multiple, multiple databases, because the fact is everybody is re-identifiable. So this gets back to the issue of the primary responsibility of protecting participants is us, all of us, and to make sure that we're well-trained and know that this is something we ought not to do. Um, you know, there will be bad players and we should have sanctions in place against those bad players. Fascinatingly, there was an article that came out of re-identification from genome that was put on the web through the Harvard system. And one of the co-authors was an ethicist or claims to be an ethicist. I mean, so we really need to all think about what are our responsibilities about not trying to re-identify people. So, Clearly um, enough bad actors and we'll get more regulation, but I think the real answer is our own training. Thank you, Lainey. I know Mike has a comment, but I, I, I'm unfortunately, Mike, we only have one minute to go and I want to keep, I want to keep us on time. So um, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank Sam for these, for, for his uh, presentation today, which was uh, outstanding as Julian mentioned. And Sam, my uh, only comment was- No, Mike, 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 sure. we're, Mike. Mike, we're, we're at one o'clock. I, I just have to, I have to make sure we finish at one because people, if we want to stay on after one, let me just finish and let people leave and then Please, you, can, you. you can make a comment. So just let me make my point. I, a, I want to make, I want to thank Sam for what he did, what he, what he spoke on today. And the second is to emphasize to every member of the Department of Pediatrics that this is the future of the Department of Pediatrics from a scholarship perspective. The senior leadership met recently and they endorsed the idea that informatics is one of the key areas that the department will focus on over the next few years. So particularly to our trainees, I want to emphasize how important this area is. And I encourage you strongly to take up Sam's uh, offer to help you think about how you may be able to use uh, the informatic resources, both within the department and within the university to uh, advance uh, pediatric, pediatric care and pediatric scholarship. So with that, I think we'll formally end, but if anybody wants to stay around, Mike Masol has a question. And